Wonderful. Uh, thank you to everybody who's starting to introduce themselves in the chat. I think we can get started. Um, like I said, my name is Laura Chekovich. I'm on the Rail Midwest team. I work both on the communications team and uh, on some of our technical support teams. We don't have slides today because we're going to be viewing sections of um, a recent documentary we made uh, last year, but I wanted to give everybody a brief introduction to Rail Midwest uh, to let you know who we are and, and where our work uh, stands in the field. Rel Midwest is one of 10 regional education laboratories, REL, uh, R-E-L, and we uh, serve the uh, most standardly defined Midwestern states, um, everything around the Great Lakes region. Uh, our work is really centered on a, th a three-legged approach. We have applied research, we have technical support, and we have engagement activities. I'm really excited about this project here today because I think that it is a great reflection of all three legs of those work working together. Um, I want to take a second uh, before we dive any deeper to introduce our panel today. Um, I'm going to get started with Jillian Davidson. Jillian, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jillian Davidson. I'm the director of the Center for Clinical Experiences at Central Michigan University, which is located in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. For those who don't know, Mount Pleasant is a rural community, primarily agriculture, uh, with a large university smack dab in the middle. So we do a lot with future teachers going to rural schools. Thank you, Jillian. Troy, would you wanna go next? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Troy Helgen. I'm the Director of Career and College Readiness at Lakes Country Service Cooperative. Uh, our office is in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. So uh, my main responsibility here is I administer the Federal Perkins Grant for 26 of our school districts in West Central Minnesota. I also uh, run our Alternative Teacher Preparation Program here at Lakes Country. We were the first alternative, approved Alternative Teacher Preparation Program in Minnesota where we offer career and technical education programs for, uh, for incumbent teachers. Great, thank you, Troy. Carrie. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Carrie Johnson. I am the 712 secondary school principal in Parker's Prairie, Minnesota. Um, we are about 100 miles down I-94 from Fargo. And we have about 540 kids in the district. And in my building, we have 280 with 44 full staff. Um, 21 teachers. Great, thank you, Carrie. And I'll turn it over to Dan. Hi, thanks, Laura. Hi, I, I'm Dan Frederking. I am the partnership facilitator for the Rel Midwest Midwest Alliance to Improve Teacher Preparation. Now, this is an alliance that we have that mostly focuses on Michigan, but certainly does not have to. Um, we are focused on the idea of teacher preparation, which has a lot to do with uh, uh, recruitment, retention, and then just teacher preparation in general. And as Laura said, we do a lot of work with uh, technical projects, like we get in and, and help districts. Some of the districts you'll be seeing in the documentary today, we work directly with and in, in, uh, diving into the data, action planning, things like that. Uh, we do a lot of research studies within the state of Michigan and beyond. And we do documentaries, just like the one you're about to see today. Um, we do have an alliance in the state that consists of a bunch of people all over the state of Michigan who uh, all sorts of stakeholders from teachers, superintendents, people from the uh, State Department of Education, union chiefs, uh, charter schools, uh, higher ed people, all sorts of people to really help us try to identify what are the biggest needs in the area of teacher preparation and what can we do to, to help address them too. Um, me personally, I'm a, I'm a rural kid myself. I grew up in a dairy farm, went to a rural school, taught high school English at a rural school for a while too, but I am very happy to be here. Back to you, Laura. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, and I just wanted to really emphasize what Dan had said and what I alluded to at the beginning. Heartbeat of the Community uh, we're, is a documentary that we're really excited about because it, it brings out this, uh, the special challenges that are faced by rural communities in the hiring and preparation and even retention of teachers uh, in rural areas. And um, like Dan mentioned, our work has stemmed doing research with the state of Michigan on this issue, providing technical support in Michigan and around the Midwest um, on, on issues of teacher preparation and retention. 
And finally, we've, we've had a lot of communications project, including this documentary um, that can feature the great research and support that's going on in the realm. Um, I did want to draw your attention. This is a pretty new uh, way that we are sharing our documentaries. Usually we do our documentary uh, screenings in person. Um, you know, turn off the lights, watch a movie, and then have a discussion. Of course, this is, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic and COVID-19 makes that impossible. So we're trying to be innovative and uh, share this documentary with you, at least in part, uh, virtually. We know that sitting through a 25 minute documentary online would not be very fun. So we're hoping to call out a few of the clips that we think will uh, be able to spur some great discussion amongst this panel. And then we hope that if you have not already had a chance to see the entire documentary that you'll be able to watch it on your own and share it um, outside. I know you'll see some familiar faces. For instance, Jillian is in the documentary. Um, so you'll, you'll already know her when you watch it. Um, like I said, uh, we are gonna be watching these clips. So I encourage you while we're watching the clips uh, to chat about what you're seeing in the chat box. Uh, we should be able to um, all have a conversation that way. And then we'll bring some of the questions that you might raise during the chat uh, during into the discussion that's going on. Um, so hopefully everybody's had access. Uh, I guess we should just get started right away. I want to um, first off introduce that this is a clip that is about uh, right at the beginning of the documentary that features one of our Rail Midwest researchers uh, discussing how we came to this project and uh, why it's so important. So Cora, uh, if you want to take it away. We looked at the teacher supply. Hi, all. This is Cora Wilson from the Realm Midwest team. Sorry about that. I was hearing duplicated echo, so I'm going to just pause and start again. In demand trends in Michigan over the last five years, the Michigan Department of Education they requested better and more comprehensive information on teacher supply and demand in Michigan. We don't find like an overall statewide shortages, but we do find shortages in some pockets. When we talk about teacher shortage in rural districts, like I fully believe we have a lot of folks certified in the state who could teach. I think it's a geographic shortage. Rural areas in our study are found to uh, be affected by teacher shortages, maybe more than so than districts in other locales. Teachers in rural areas have higher, I would say, attrition or have lower retention uh, than teachers in other geographic areas. A lot of people want that city life and feel. However, when you're living in an area where I was, you're an hour away from the nearest urban center. You're away from that stuff. Being able to go to have choices of restaurants, shopping, uh, movie theaters, that sort of thing. That's one thing that um, rural schools sometimes have a hard time competing against. We're limited geographically here. So we really can't be attracting enough kids to make up for the lack of funds. We need awareness that we're falling behind and it's not because we're not working hard enough or we're asking for the moon. We need more teachers who are trained, who can work closely with these kids, whose needs are greater and greater as time goes by. Can't speak for the other districts, but in our district for 20% of teachers to no longer be there from two years ago is, is mind boggling. I think the challenges maybe stem from having to do a lot of different things. I think as a teacher in a rural district, you might be asked not only to teach, but maybe to coach a sport and advise a club and lead a committee. It's more difficult to be a teacher in a rural area because you're spread more thin. I mean, we haven't had a school nurse ever. We've lost our librarians years ago. We don't have a curriculum director. We do it all. That jack of all trades sometimes is difficult because you have to become an expert in such a wide variety of areas. Other challenges, I think, are finances in a rural district when you have a limited budget. It makes it more difficult to recruit and retain a teacher 
because they may literally be the entire English department for a secondary building. Or you could be in a situation where we need to hire you as the English teacher, but we also need somebody who can teach social studies and science. And so to find somebody with multiple certifications across multiple grade levels becomes more difficult. And that I think is a barrier to initial hire and then a barrier to retaining. And so you don't find a gargantuan amount of people thinking genuinely about this as something that they want to do. When they know that it is not well funded, they know that in some areas it's not well supported, they know that some people in the industry are warning them not to do this. You could have situations where there are plenty of people to fill particular teaching slots, but you worry about the quality of, of those people that are applying to fill a slot. So that might be a situation where there's not actually a shortage. You can find someone, but there's still a staffing challenge to find someone that you think is going to be really good at what they're going to be doing for the class. Evidence suggests that teacher quality and the variation in teacher quality can have pretty profound impacts on student achievement. So as everybody joins, I'd encourage people in the chat to share. Do those challenges resonate with you? And how about everybody on camera? Do those challenges sound like what you're experiencing in your districts and in your schools? How many of you have served in more than one role when you were a teacher? <laughs> yep, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so I wanna ask right away, uh, Troy and Carrie, in Minnesota, what challenges do you face in rural hiring preparation and retention? Carrie, do you wanna get us started? Sure. Um... It's things that you don't really think about. It's the co the compensation. Will it will it be comparable to that of even our neighboring district, which has four thousand students in it? Um, housing enough um, places for them to live and gr grow a family. Can we retain them in the community? Um, are we getting highly qualified candidates? Um, how about their student loans? Will they be making enough to um, pay off their student loans and make a living out of the deal? And are they willing, um, or do we, even more than that, do we as leaders need to put them into a position where they've got so many hats to wear that the position itself is overwhelming, where they could be a master teacher in another district teaching one prep and maybe not coaching and leading um, so it's really important that we have decent mentorship and um, it's also very difficult to diversify the staff in rural Minnesota. And I'll, I'll uh, kind of piggyback on to what Carrie just said too. Um, you know, in the work we were doing around teacher preparation, um, th there's, a, there's a, a great big elephant in the room when we talk about um, diversifying our teacher workforce. Our, uh, for Economic Development Region 4, which is the nine counties of, uh, of West Central Minnesota, we have a pop student population, I think in 2017, of about 16% of our students are students of color, and yet we finally breached 1.1% of our teachers uh, are teachers of color, uh, identify themselves as teachers of color, which is abhorrently horrible. Um, by their by that nature that 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 it's 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 not good um, so as we continue to uh, go down this path is we, we're not we're not really addressing uh, the significant amount of the data the research shows that um, students of color have better experiences when they when they see themselves reflected in the classroom and they're not um, and how do we continue to uh, increase that um, on top of the statewide uh, numbers are not really, frankly, that much better. Um, so there, it's just exorbitant the number of issues that we're having, not only at a local level, but even at a regional level as well. Troy and Carrie, I know that um, there's a well, a well cited statistic that 60% uh, of teachers end up teaching within 15 miles of where they graduated. And I know that that ends up really leading into this challenge of diversifying the workforce, especially in rural areas, because uh, the younger generation is much more diverse 
than people say who are returning to teaching. So what's going on in Minnesota to try to overcome that? What, what policies are being undertaken by the state and by your districts? Statewide, there are a number of different uh, initiatives that are that are working uh, that that are attempting to to change those those numbers, uh, including some uh, some significant financial uh, uh, state government financial um, uh, pieces for loan forgiveness and, and grants around increasing teachers of color. There's a an act that was uh, attempted to be passed by the legislature called the, the Tolkate Act, uh, in basically increasing teachers of color. Uh, and in, in indigenous teachers um, about a year ago, which has not passed through the legislature yet. Um, I, I think the, the careful thing we have to be aware of is this is not just a one, um, a one approach piece. The thing that we, we tend to forget is throwing money on that end of the, uh, of the spectrum of the quote unquote teacher pipeline is uh, ignores the fact that we have to fundamentally have, uh, st frankly, students have to have good experiences in school in order to become teachers. Um, and let's be very honest, the number of our students of color are not having good and positive uh, experiences in school. So uh, how do we do that? How do we shift the mental models around that? And so I think that's a lot of what we're trying to do in our region is, is how do we become aware? How do we, how are we as our predominantly white teaching staff um, how do we, how do we, how are we uh, impacting the, uh, the, the teacher work, the, the, our students' experiences in our schools, and how do we make sure that that doesn't continue to, uh, to exacerbate the issues that we've, that we've already been ex experiencing, our students are experiencing. Great. And I, I wanted to build off of that um, because we did get a question in the chat about identifying the root causes of the lack of diversity. Um, in, in the represented student groups. Is there anything you would want to add about root causes, um, particularly in rural areas? Boy, that's a great question that um, I, I think would be a great dissertation topic um, <laughs> that uh, I, I, I would suspect that um, there are a variety of root causes and for me to, uh, to uh, identify them would be a little bit presumptuous. But I think that uh, the experiences for which they're having in schools right now is, um, is probably one of the root causes. Great. And Dan, I saw you were responding in the chat. Do you want to say more about your response? Sure, yeah. This is, um, that is something, the point you're making, uh, Carol, is wonderful because that is exactly what needs to be done. And, and it's kind of more of a qualitative look into all of these things. But that is something we're doing with one of our partner districts in Michigan. Um, and we always tend to use a protocol, we always call it the five whys, and five is just a random number because it could go a lot deeper than that or, or it could be less. But it's, we look at a piece of data, we come up with a finding, and then we ask, well, why is that happening? And then once we come up with a, an answer to that question, we ask, now, why is that happening? And we try to get as deep as we can until we reach something that uh, gives us an action item, some, something that if we directly address this, Will it positively change this? And so that's kind of been the protocol we've used. Great. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, uh, Troy and Carrie. Troy, I wanted to uh, echo back on something you were just saying about um, experiences for teachers. Our next clip actually gets at how we attract uh, student teachers into the profession in the ways that uh, we can focus on that uh, entry point of the pipeline rather than trying to diversify the teaching workforce at the end. So uh, Cora, if you could bring up the next clip and we can watch some of the experiences that we were documented uh, about early workforce. Teaching is an extremely noble profession, and I feel like we need to really show students uh, what they're going to be experiencing before they go to college so that they can make an educated decision as to whether or not they want to pursue teaching. One type of um, partnership is the uh, Grow Your Own programs, where like districts and to the teacher preparation programs to help create more streamlined pathways for teachers to teach in their own local communities. 
I want you to make a sentence using a Comer conjugation. And I'll walk around and check to see if you're right. The Teacher Academy is a program for high school juniors and seniors who are interested in exploring the teaching profession. It's a two-year program, and the bulk of the time in this program is spent in classrooms working with students, sort of like a student teacher would. And every marking period, they change placements, so they get a total of eight different age levels and subjects to work with. I have 19 participating districts in this program. Everyone is considered rural geographically. I think by exposing the Teacher Academy students to a classroom, I think it, it helps them dive right into a class. They can see that every class is unique. And how do you work with this student? How do you handle when this child is having a bad morning? And it, it provides those high school students that here's the reality of what it is to run a classroom. Um, so many kids, they, they'll say, well, I want to go into teaching because I love children. And that's obviously a first first point to have, but then it's also knowing how to handle the children of all varieties of personalities and academic strengths. And having the chance to do it in high school, it gives them an earlier exposure to it. So if you say that the rocket's as fast as lightning, lightning strikes really fast, right? So you'd pretty much just be saying the rocket's going really fast. So you just have to break down what the similar metaphor is saying. Last September when I first walked into the classroom, I was super overwhelmed because I was super scared, super nervous. I was like, they're not going to think that I'm like a teacher. They're going to just think of me as a high school student. But now I definitely know that they do think of me like a teacher. I think it creates a resiliency that might not exist if you just start kind of as an adult. There's a real practical end to this. So they are in classrooms. They're working with kids every day. They are making handouts, bulletin boards. I mean, they're getting really dirty into the end of what it's like behind the curtain for a teacher. They have to start asking questions about when do you get to school? When do you leave school? How much do you take home when you go? How much time do you think you spend planning for a 50 minute lesson? And to me, those are the realistic pieces of teaching, recognizing that it's not just 8 to 2.30 every day. I think it's definitely mentally and emotionally preparing you because you get in the mindset of a teacher, especially shadowing the other teacher. You get to learn about what they're doing behind the scenes along with the actual teaching. So you're kind of seeing what you'd be getting yourself into in a way. So emotionally and mentally preparing yourself to be a teacher just the surprises that you can never read about in a book, especially in a rural area, like low socioeconomic, like a student that, you know, they might not have eaten that weekend and they come to school or they saw their parents get into a fight or something happened, uh, not to dwell on the negative, but that is a lot what we deal with and uh, just how to deal with that off the cuff. Like there's no training for that. <laughs> and they just really understand if teaching is something they want to do. So if they do enter the teaching profession, they're going to stick with it. I really like having that interaction with them, being able to see their faces light up when they understand a question or when I'm able to help them understand that question. Great. Um, I was watching the chat and it looks like Jillian, our panelist, and Boyd, one of our attendees, were having a great discussion about how to diversify the pipeline uh, using Grow Your Own Models and, and uh, giving high schoolers these opportunities. Jillian, I know that a lot of the students that are in uh, this documentary, especially uh, in this clip, might end up being CMU students since they're in that area. And I wanted to ask you, um, you know, how do you see those programs playing into the preparation that ends up happening at your university? And in answering that question about diversifying the pipeline, you were mentioning that and things end up getting in the way of uh, students of color who want to become teachers. Yes, um, so I think programs like the one that was highlighted in the documentary really they take the opportunity to harness the passion and the excitement that high school students have for education and connect them with a, a really educated and, and one-on-one um, -on -one mentor that often you wouldn't get in teacher ed until me maybe your third year of really. So they're getting clinical experiences before they've ever, you know, stepped foot on a, a college campus. And so I think by having these 
these types of programs, you're really connecting students into teacher ed from the word go. Um, of course, we would love to have these students then come back to CMU. And one of the things that we do at CMU is we work with these districts to ex explain to them that these candidates can then return home for student teaching. So they're building into these candidates in high school, getting them excited about the profession. They're partnering with an institution of higher ed like CMU. And then CMU is then partnering back at the end of the program for the student teaching internship. Great. And, and um, I, I want to make sure I get at uh, now how COVID-19 and the effect of students maybe not being in school and not necessarily having access to student teaching opportunities has impacted the preparation side uh, for you. What are you seeing, Jillian? So, um, so obviously we had about 180 student teachers in the field in March when COVID um, became an issue that was unavoidable and all schools shut down. So what we did with them was we worked with their cooperating teachers and encouraged them to still be doing their clinical experiences through a hybrid learning model, just like their host teachers did. We also provided them professional development that they could seek out that was on hybrid instruction or um, some other digital media that we allowed them to pick and choose what was interesting for them so that it was relevant to their grade band content area. And we allowed them to really um, find professional development that was personally interesting. But that was how we kind of kept clinical experiences going through March, April, and May. And uh, we've infused mock interviewing that's done all online, some virtual talent fair type things. Um, so we've really been using as much media, digital media as we can to support clinical. Thank you. Um, Dan, Carrie, and Troy, I wanted to open it up to you guys to share some, experience, uh, share some examples of what you've seen uh, in response to the pandemic. How are you seeing either in your own school or in districts that you're working with uh, people handling the need for student teaching opportunities? In Minnesota around teacher preparation is a vast majority of candidates that were in the midst of student teaching were not able to complete and statutorily they required to do 12, 12 weeks of student teaching. Um, uh, there's been a lot of waivers around that. Um, so many of our candidates that were in the midst of their student teaching have now been waivered through the process to be granted a license. Um, uh, simply because of the nature of the pandemic. So uh, it's, it, you know, whether that continues, whether I suspect will, will be the case. Um, uh, I think a, a piece that I wanna make sure that is that we're clear about, um, or that I'm clear about is that we have a tendency to think, and, and, and I appreciate the, the panel's conversations, I appreciate you know, Boyd's, Dr. Bradbury's uh, injections on, in the chat is we, we can't think of uh, teacher preparation or candidate preparation of any way or shape or form as, as an either or. Uh, we have to be thinking about all of this as a both and. Um, candidates have to be able to come through traditional teacher preparation and be well prepared to become teachers. Candidates also have to come through uh, non-traditional teacher preparation programs to be well prepared as well. We have to think about where uh, we have to think about how are we how are we preparing teachers through our recruitment through um, our secondary programming, for example, like what what uh, through a teacher cadet type of program like Jillian was talking about. Um, and and how are we also bringing uh, uh, high quality folks that are from business and industry, particularly within career and technical education, that have the ability, that have the knowledge and skills and abilities that that could eat, that are great, could be great teachers, and have all of these barriers in place because of um, a traditional mindset of be, becoming a, tr a prepared teacher. Um, I think we have to start thinking about things in a broader term that uh, in Minnesota, you have to, there's basically three steps to be a teacher. You have to prove competence in the standards of effective practice, which are the pedagogy standards. You have to prove competence in the standards around the content and you have to pass a couple of tests. Um, and uh, there, we have to think about ways in providing those three steps in ways other than just taking coursework as well. Um, uh, coursework is perfectly fine for a, a vast number of 
candidates, but for some candidates, it's not. If we have, if I have a teacher, I can tell you example of a teacher after teacher that are incredibly good teachers that have never once taken a college pedagogy course, nor should they ever have to simply because, because they're already great teachers. Uh, so I think we just have to think about things in, in a variety of different ways and stop thinking about uh, creating these mental models that only one pathway types of exists. And, that, and I'd like to add to that too. The, the ones in higher education that I've been talking to, the, the people that work for uh, colleges of education, um, often say the ones who are affected this year, the, the teachers who are entering the field after just graduating this past year, uh, what they missed was largely the student teaching, the experience part. They've been through all the coursework and everything. And so what that means likely, and, and I'm, I don't work in higher education, so Jillian, tell me if what I'm saying is wrong. But what that often tends to mean, I think, is that they might be relatively competent, competent, but they might not be confident in what they're doing. Um, that they might uh, be going out there without the normal amount of hours that they usually log. And so districts are going to have to just be aware of that and support them as they start their first few months. Yes, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, I personally was teaching a seminar of student teachers when all of this hit. So I had, you know, a group of 19 teacher candidates from the Grand Rapids area on the west side of the state that I was working with. And they were very nervous and they felt, while they were really appreciative that they got to see the hybrid learning and they feel like that is a unique skill set that now that they have to offer and they were able to really develop a repertoire of education that they maybe wouldn't have, they do feel very nervous for the amount of time that they didn't get. Um, and some were, were even asking if they could pause and wait and come back in the fall, which we did give them the option. If they wanted to take an incomplete and come back in the fall, we gave them that option. Um, so yes, I agree. Competent and maybe lacking some confidence is a good way to put it. I'm just curious, Jillian, how many took you up on the um, waiver or the incomplete and coming back in the fall? None. Okay. Uh, our student population is primarily um, middle to lower economic level. If you looked at demographics of our student population and the idea of waiting another six months to take a job yeah. uh, it was, was the barrier for them. So we kind of we talked with them about how do you ask for a strong mentor? What things can you do over the summer months to help yourself prepare? But yeah, we did make that available, but unfortunately, you know, the realities of life are what they are. Yeah. Jillian, we have a question in the chat about providing virtual clinical experience and virtual support. Um, has CMU undertaken that? Troy, are you doing anything in your alternative prep program that way? Either of you? Yeah, we have not yet because we're still on the we're still on the real front end of the launch uh, of our programs. Um, so no, we have not yet. It, uh, it would be a really difficult thing to do, but yeah. Um, yes, we have. We actually had two summer clinical experiences that happened over summer one, what we call summer one session, and so one was a special education pre-student teaching course and the other was an English 460. So these are secondary uh, secondary English teacher candidates. So they will be going into student teaching in the fall. So we did do uh, virtual clinicals with them. They were each a little bit different, but essentially they had mentor teachers that they worked with via online platforms, some very specific policies we had to put in place to protect. You know, when you introduce technology, there are some security things that we wanna make sure both the K-12 students are safe as well as our teacher candidates are safe. There's just a lot. Technology is not always good. It can be gray, it can be. So we just wanted to, to provide some safety there. But yes, we have, and we're looking at continuing that uh, for fall and some of our exploratory clinical, which is a new thing we're starting, which will be all virtual. And just one other note too, it's really tricky uh, also is the way rules and regulations are written at the licensure level too, is, is the definition of a field experience doesn't necessarily, uh, in the pure definition of a field experience in, that, in Minnesota rule doesn't 
it'd be questionable whether or not that would even be allowable um, uh, without with some variance, uh, particularly by the board, uh, by the Pelsby board, it could certainly be. But again, there's again, we're, we're in this living in this time that I would I, I always say we're living in a time that's yet to be named. Um, it's it's nebulous. And uh, I also want to protect my candidates as well as much as possible to make sure that whatever we're doing, they get the license in the end. Great. I want to build off of um, it, what Dan said. They have uh, the the expertise, but not the confidence. I, I you said it better than I did, Dan. But Carrie, when you're thinking about hiring new teachers, if either you or other principals that you're working with, how are you approaching hiring? Uh, a when teachers maybe can't come to your your campus and and meet with you in person, and when maybe they don't have those clinical experiences for those brand new teachers. So in our district, we've been interviewing by Hangouts or Zoom, and um, the questions are completely different than they would be if we were in person. We have to ask questions that um, address their um, competency in a different manner than we would be able to if we were able to see body language and have a dialogue, giving a tour of the building or whatever it may be. So when I interviewed, I interviewed with fewer questions and more um, leading dialogue so we could have a chance to really get to know the person in a, in a really unusual format. Um, and in my building, I have one new teacher coming and in the elementary building, they have two. And normally we would do a new teacher induction in August, mid-August, somewhere in there. And I'm starting mine this week and we're gonna do weeklies. We're gonna do as much phone contact and voice to voice as we can get him as many resources as possible and um like <laughs> I'm actually on my phone right now because I gave him my computer because he doesn't even have a computer yet so <laughs> you gotta you gotta do what you gotta do sometimes and um and uh, I'm really anxious to be able to prepare him as much as possible knowing that there are three possibilities we're back, we're not back, or we do a hybrid. So um, as much as I've got to prepare the staff, I've got to have him confident in the same. Absolutely. Um, well, I wanted to transition to our final clip, uh, which will kind of go back to uh, our the earlier part of our conversation where we're uh, thinking about ties to the community and bringing in teachers through non-traditional pathways who already have connections in rural communities. So Cora, I will uh, leave it to you to put that up. The best advertisement for an area is having someone actually be part of the community. There are lots of rural areas that just may be skipped over by job applicants because they don't know much about the area. Lakeland Elementary uh, serves the greater surrounding area of Elk Rapids. A lot of teachers from the neighboring districts do seem to apply for our positions. What we are starting to see though is that new teacher out of college, that applicant pool has really started to dwindle. The evidence is that a pretty high percentage of teacher candidates end up employed in the same school districts in which they did their student teaching. And I think it's something like close to 20% end up employed in the very same school. Oftentimes student teaching is not happening in, in a rural school system. And so when they are thinking about applying for jobs, they may not apply to some systems that look like they're way out in the middle of, of nowhere to them. I think that there is a real opportunity to have student teachers go out and get to know the community and, and say, hey, you know, maybe I wouldn't have thought about this place. So at Central Michigan University, we have affiliation agreements with other community colleges where we allow students to stay in their community and do the bulk of their teacher preparation program in their area. We bring CMU's program to the campus. Our faculty travel to them. We really work with the community that is there um, to offer the high quality programming for those students. In communities like this one, specifically rural communities, uh, oftentimes it's hard to recruit teachers to come there. One of the unique features of CMU's teacher education program is that we allow our students to return home to do their student teaching internship. 
And so by allowing people to go home where they have connections, they're already rooted there. And so it makes sense. That is really how a lot of rural areas are recruiting. And so because we allow our students to take advantage of that, we place everywhere across the lower peninsula all the way up to the upper peninsula. I became a host teacher because I really believe in this profession. It's not just about teaching the kids in the room, it's about training the next level up because someday someone's going to have to step into my shoes and I would like to think that they're going to be dedicated and that they're going to work as hard as anybody else I work with. We can't take one away from zero, so we have to go over to our tens place value. Anissa is a non-traditional student in that she already has one degree and then uh, had a whole whole life as a, as a mother. When I had children, I recognized that I had a passion to make a difference and teaching just seemed to fit. She grew up here and to be able to give back is meaningful. She's also got everything she really needs already in place. She's smart. She's capable. She relates well with the kids. Um, she would be a great asset. The program that I am in is an extension of CMU, and the program here offers night courses, weekend courses that meet the needs of moms and dads and non-traditional students. It's something I could work with to get where I needed to be. She was able to still balance all of the things that mothers have to do on a day-to-day -day basis and still be a, a full-time student. And now she's finishing up student teaching here. It's a process that we have to try to get as much in in the period of time that she'll be with me to give her the tools she'll need for when she has to do it on her own. When you're out in the field and engaging with high quality practitioners and you're actually working with children for the first time and they're connecting the theories and the, the content and then they're actually seeing them applied either through observations or then the first time doing it themselves and either wildly succeeding or wildly failing, whichever way, they're able to learn so much from that. If they don't have a little taste of that before they're thrown into it, we lose them. I mean, there's a reason we lose so many teachers before they've even put five years into the profession. It's because they there there are all those plates spinning and they're not ready for it. Every day you're building a little bit at a time and bringing her into it so that as I model it, then I step back and then she tries it. This is a real example of grow your own, which we're seeing with a lot of our rural partners where they're really stressing students who grew up in their communities who maybe didn't get a teaching degree right away, but they're connecting them with programs like ours that are accessible to non-traditional students and saying, we will even support you, we will help you get that degree, and then come back, <laughs> come back and fill one of these roles here because we want you home. I hope Anissa does become a teacher in our school district. Student teaching experience helps their quality of preparation, particularly if you uh, place them in the right kind of schools. And so when you're able to have someone come back to their hometown, they're less likely to leave. And so it does provide a sense of community and security for students that they know I've seen that person in the hall. I know who that is and that, oh, next year she's going to be my teacher. Wonderful. Um, so we are so lucky that we also have an Anissa on the chat today and she was uh, saying saying hello to Jillian. So uh, thank you, Anissa, for joining us. Um, I wanted to follow up that clip by asking Carrie, um, what approaches are you using similar to these in your district uh, that to recruit and retain teachers? Do these really resonate with your experience? Are there other things that we haven't talked about yet that you're doing? Um, I really liked the point about rural schools don't always get um, people to student teach in them. And so we have a staff member who is on faculty at a university that's about an hour away. And so she's always recruiting people to do clinicals here. We've got a great um, agricultural program and they're working to get people here, um, a lot of networking from the staff to get people here. 
as far as students who go to school here, it, when they show interest, we really try to foster that um, as best as we can within the district or give them opportunities to network with scientists or um, English teachers from out of district some, some way. It's kind of a make it as you go, create it for individuals as you can in a role setting. Yeah, thank you. And I want to ask everybody in the chat the same question. You know, we, we've seen a couple examples of ways to recruit and retain in rural areas, but what's working in your district or what have you seen work in your state um, that we haven't talked about yet today? Um, Jillian, I wanted to ask uh, a little bit more about the program that we saw that Anissa was uh, a, a teacher through. Can you share how that program reaches teachers in some of the most rural areas? Sure. So that program is actually, a, it is a partnership with another college that there is in Traverse City, um, NMC. And so we have an affiliation agreement with NMC and they have affiliation agreement with, with other institutions from across the state with different programs. They just partner with us specific for teacher ed. So students are enrolling in NMC, which I believe stands for North Michigan College, but I could be wrong. Uh, I just know it is NMC in Traverse City. Um, but they enroll there and they do their first two year of undergraduate work through their courses right at M NMC with NMC faculty. And then they transition into CMU's teacher education program. They're advised by a faculty advisor who drives to campus faculty travel there to do all of their courses there. Their clinicals are all in the region, so we send coordinators there to work with them. So everything is there for them, and it's a, it's a program we've had for many years. So there are cohorts that go through. There's usually a new cohort starting, I think, every three years. That program has been wildly successful. Um, we're currently trying to develop more such programs. We have one in Lansing, uh, which is um, it's a little outside of Lansing, so it's once again a rural rural partnership. And then we're also looking, we've had some communication with districts in Gaylord and some other areas in northern Michigan where districts would like to partnership with partner with us, excuse us, to do something similar. Thank you. Um, so Troy and Carrie, I, I, Carrie shared a little bit about what her district is doing, but Troy, what other things do you see going on around the, the state? And then Dan, if you've got any regional examples too, I'm sure people would love to hear how, how uh, people are being successful at this. I, I jokingly tell my CTE teachers that I work with that they can't retire until they find their replacement. Um, and they recruit not their own joke, replacement. Though. No, but it's not really a joke. <laughs> um, and it's actually, ironically, it, it works sometimes. Um, and uh, because that also creates a little bit sense of, of pride in their own work and pride in their own um, in their own program and understanding what what the importance of that that type are the importance of CTE programs are um, so there's there's some truth to that uh, you know the, the, the big picture uh, around uh, what we need to do better uh, in our in our rural settings as well is those partnerships with colleges and universities that offer that offer opportunities to uh, give our secondary students offer for college credit in their post secondaries. Uh, there are barriers to those pieces that, for a variety of different reasons, just because the two systems don't like to matriculate uh, to each other horribly well, which are policy systems and policy design types of things that we need to work on. Um, but I think we we oftentimes uh, put our put put those barriers in place ourselves uh, with with so we just need to get over that uh, and really work towards those pieces and decide who's the who's this for is this for the adults that are in this building or are in our systems or is this for the kids that are in the system and as soon as we can start shifting the idea that this is this is not for the adults this is for the kids then i think we'll be much more successful I'll go ahead and chat here. A few, a few things that I have seen, th these things are not for everybody, but things that I have seen districts be able to do. Um, one of them that I always thought was fascinating was I saw a rural district buy a house and allow the student teacher to live in it every, you know, just for a semester. Because that's, if you're not from the area, where are you gonna live for one semester in these rural schools? And uh, obviously not everybody can do that, but I love that, I love that idea when I saw it. Um, uh, another thing that I, I observed one time was uh, a district 
completely redoing their salary schedule to the point where it's really front loaded so that the the district was paying more um to, to first year teachers than a lot of other districts would be around them. But then, you know, because there of course are restrictions, it didn't advance quite as much. Um, the theory, I guess, being that once you get them in, then, then you, that getting them in the door is one of the most important things there too. Um, and then of course, traveling for job fairs. I know we're getting into an age where virtual job fairs are becoming a thing. And I think that's great too, but traveling for job fairs as well, travel all over the state because Sometimes it's a numbers game, right? <laughs> Reach as many people as you can. Yeah, thank you, Dan. I appreciate you bringing up some of those more creative options. I know in the documentary, there's a little bit of sharing about and um, some other creative ways that districts are handling it. We've just sort of drawn out these major ones uh, for this event today, but I would really encourage everyone to check out the whole documentary uh, to hear some of those other examples uh, and to to just check out what's going on in Michigan generally and thinking about how it can apply to your context. Um, I know we're running to the end here, uh, so I wanted to repeat that we are happy to take your questions. Uh, you will also see from my colleague Sarah Rand in the chat, she's left a link to our survey. As I mentioned at the very beginning, this is our first time trying this type of an event. And so we would really love your feedback on uh, how it worked and if, uh, if it was effective at sharing, sharing our resources. Um, so unless we have uh, any questions pop up, I'd love to just close out with uh, each of you on the panel having an opportunity to share what your like top resource or top takeaway when you've been thinking about this challenge of recruiting and retaining and preparing teachers for rural contexts in an age where we are all remote uh, has been. I'd be happy to start. Um, first of all, so I, I do work with Rel Midwest. If anyone wants to reach out to me, my information is there in the, in the chat box along with everybody else's, but I'd be happy to talk. I mean, we're always looking for ways to partner with districts and things like that. And so, um, please reach out to me. I'd love to, I'd love to talk more. Uh, one thing that, that I, I have heard people talking about, and, and sometimes I feel like it's, it's kind of an elephant in the room too, but uh, current, so the kids who go into the teaching profession have experienced the education field uh, as well as everybody else. And the teachers that they've had are always going to be a big influence on them. And Unfortunately, sometimes we have teachers who don't speak about the profession so positively either. Uh, so that always is something to attack. I mean, if we go back to talking about root causes, um, you know, why are the students not wanting to go into the profession? Well, maybe it's because they've heard bad things about it from their teachers. Well, why have they heard bad things about it from their teachers? We can dig deep into that too. It might become a culture and climate issue. But I think that's something that we shouldn't ignore as well. Thank you, Dan. And I, and I think even just kind of even to piggyback after on what Dan said is um, my challenge is, is on this and frankly around everything in education is we need to switch from the idea that we're all about teaching and switch it to thinking about learning. Um, we have to switch our systems from thinking being designed around the adults and start to, uh, shifting our systems to be designed around the students. Because I think until we really come to the understanding that that's our, frankly our entire system is designed around adults and is not designed around the students so until we really do shift that we are not going to make progress when i spoke earlier about the intentionality of the interview process the questions need to reflect just what troy is saying the questions need to reflect that the kids are of utmost importance and um we as leaders need to remember that our relationship with our soon to be hiree or with all the candidates actually begins when they submit their application. So how can we make sure that um, from the get go, they know that we've got their back, that the um, integrity of the team is important and that we want them on the team. Um, you know, um, when, like I said, I hired somebody this, this spring and um, whenever possible, I try to help with finding housing, um, finding different ways that they are in, 
integrated into the community before that first workshop so that it's not a bunch of strange faces when they come into the workshop that members of the community know them and you can only have a successful team if the relationships start there and the focus is on the student learning. Great, thank you, Carrie. Um, and I think the one thing that I'll add that I've taken away from, from this documentary and from the panel that we had earlier, um, I think it was in December, so um, in late 2019, um, the thing that I would add is advocacy for the profession and policies that are better for teachers and um, make schools better for kids. When we reduce class sizes, when, we're, when our compensation packages and things that we're offering to teacher candidates are the same as what they would be as a starting architect or engineer or nurse or something, when we can be competitive in those markets, that makes a difference for kids because then we're not just getting the kids who couldn't hack it, for lack of better language, in some of these other professions. We're getting the top tier academic scholars who want to teach kids because they love kids and they love their they love their, their content, and that's what we need. It shouldn't be an either or. Um, I've always loved kids, but that just doesn't have a nice life, so I'll just coach T-ball on the side and be an insurance salesman. There's nothing wrong with selling insurance if that's where your heart is, but I hate to see students at 19 or 20 years old making these really hard decisions because they're afraid of student loans. They're afraid of some of these things. So policy advocacy, teacher loan forgiveness, whatever we can do to make our profession a profession again is what we need to do because that's going to make things better on the other end for kids and kids are all that matters in this field. So I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, thank you, Jillian. Um, and I, I think it's just about time to close out. So I wanted to thank you all again uh, for your participation on this panel and uh, for helping us share the word about this documentary. Um, we hope that it's helpful to all of our attendees and that you can share the documentary far and wide. We have a viewing guide affiliated with the documentary that asks some of these same questions. If you'd like to share the documentary with your colleagues and, and have a conversation, those, the viewing guide can really help that conversation get started. I wanna echo Dan's uh, request for people to feel free to reach out. Everybody uh, on the panel put their contact information in the chat. So if you have a follow-up question that you'd like to ask uh, here at Realm Midwest, we're happy to field that and I'm happy to connect you to someone uh, if you didn't get their email address, you can just reply. Uh, one last call for people to uh, submit their surveys so that we can know if this worked or not. And uh, otherwise, have a wonderful afternoon and thank you very much. <laughs>